In Let's start taking a look at atomic instruction sequences in general. So, the previous solution we started looking at uh, interrupts in general and using interrupts to implement critical section, interrupts to in implement locks. Okay. The problem with disabling interrupts in general is that it can be dangerous. Uh, interrupts should not be disabled for a long time. For example, what happens if the variable you try to acquire is uh, takes quite a bit of time, you know, a few hundred cycles. In general, you may miss other important interrupts, there's a keyboard, a mouse, uh, other in I.O. interrupts possibly. It doesn't work well on a multiprocessor because when you disable interrupts, you got to disable across all processors because what happens if you disable interrupts on one processor but then the other one's interrupts enabled and you have two people trying to acquire the lock at the same time. They would both succeed, um, and so it doesn't work with a multiprocessor unless um, you disable all interrupts in all processors. And disabling interrupts in all processors requires broadcast messages. Uh, such mechanisms almost are non-existent in current CPUs and would be very time-consuming, which is why they don't exist. Um, alternatively, atomic read, modify, write instruction sequences are supported by hardware now. They will be supported by hardware in the future and they're pretty much standardized and so no system typically uses uh, these interrupt techniques for implementing the locks. We always use read modify write instructions. Uh, the reason I did present those was to demonstrate that that is also an alternative way to implement atomic sequences and in some parts of the operating system kernel, uh, namely in the interrupt handlers themselves, um, you do have this sequence of disabling and enabling interrupts. And the atomic secret operations can be used in both processors, uh, multi cores and single core systems. So now we're going to take a look at how you would implement um, locks using a test and set instruction, for example. We looked at the semantics of a test and set. Let's look at how you would implement it in a program. So you have two variables, uh, a lock value, which is zero, and then the lock pointer itself, which is indicated by that. Uh, and then your lock acquirer is very simple. You try to test the lock, uh, and if the lock is free, that is lock value zero, then you would read a zero, and then you would test that it's zero, and then set the value to one. So you keep spinning until the lock is busy. So if you read a value of zero, that means you were able to set a one, and so your lock acquirer succeeded. So you break out until the lock is uh, held and when the lock becomes free you break out of the loop okay and if the lock is free the test and set will complete um, and then you would set it to busy so that you inform other threads that someone has acquired the lock and then you would complete if the lock is busy then you just keep uh, spinning and you keep repeatedly testing the lock until the lock becomes free. Lock release is a very simple operation. All you got to do is indicate the value that the lock is free. Initially, note that the value is zero. So you start off with the value of zero. If you start with the one, then these, everything would change. So you would, if the lock, you could have the situation where the lock is one, uh, this one spins on zero, and this one's a release. Right? It could go the, uh, the other way as well. Uh, you would be testing and unsetting it in some ways, which that instruction also exists, by the way. So, one of the interesting questions that I want you to think about with this lock is, does this lock have bounded weighting? Uh, just to refresh our memory, uh, we spoke about bounded weighting in the uh, two segments ago, um, in the first part of week three, just so that you can, uh, just a cross-reference so that you can go back and look. But in general, bounded weighting means every thread uh, makes progress in a bounded amount of steps. Right. So you're guaranteed to make progress in a bounded amount of steps in respect to what other threads are doing. You could have a hundred other threads trying to acquire the lock at the same time, but you are guaranteed uh, to make progress in a fixed amount of your steps. So I want you to think about carefully about whether this lock has bound weighting. Uh, we'll get to um, the performance issues of the lock in a few slides. Okay, so that is a basic spin lock. 
And now let's try to look at the different performance aspects and how it scales. So we look at, um, as you increase the number of threads that contend for the lock, how the lock's performance itself varies. Okay. So the basic spin lock, you have more than one person spinning on the lock. One of them gets to go through the critical section in case it's the blue one, so that's gone through all the way, and finally release the you know, gets the lock, does its critical section, finally releases the lock. What happens to these other guys? What happens to the blue and green guys right, who didn't get the lock? So, first lock introduces a sequential bottleneck, first overhead. right? So what's going to happen is each of these guys are going to queue up behind the blue guy. So you had three guys running in parallel. Um, now they've all you know, moved here, so they've all become sequential. And so that's one of the first uh, bottlenecks introduced uh, by a spin lock. Locks also suffer from contention. Note that the blue and the green guy are not quiet. When they queue up behind the blue guy, they continue to spin, testing the lock, checking if the lock has become free for them to acquire. So this spinning part is not free because in a conventional system, uh, the spinning essentially not what it's doing. It's spinning and checking the variable in a tight loop. Checking the variable means that you're going to go hit the lock variable all the time. Apart from the blue guy, all these other guys are going to hit the lock variable. And when they do that, the lock variable itself suffers contention. And then what's going to happen is this reset of the lock is going to be a slow process because of the burning of the lock variable because of the fact that it's being contended upon. Notice that these are distinct phenomena. The first phenomenon is sequential bottleneck. In some ways, that's an artifact of a program. All these guys are queuing up behind the lock, part of the lock semantics. And second, that the lock variable is being contended for heavily just by people testing it for if it's free when it's not free is causing it uh, a lot of overhead on the lock variable itself and the lock release operation slows down significantly. Sequential bottleneck, no parallelism. Contention, it's not, it's not the parallelism software, it's just that the lock overheads are going to increase. All right. So let's look at a basic test and set lock and try to understand why uh, this contention happens, right? And why? What is it? Why does it demonstrate this behavior on this system? So essentially, to review, test and set is just a boolean value. A test and set instruction swaps true with the current value. It returns the value if the prior value was true or false. So if it was a false, then your lock succeeded. If it was true, then the lock still set. Uh, you go back to spinning, and you can reset by just writing false. Test and set, you can also refer to the get and set in simple terminology. So if you were to write this, this is with Java syntax, just easier to understand. Uh, you would have an atomic boolean val, uh, you have a synchronized method, right? So I'm not using the test and set instruction, but I'm using a synchronized function which guarantees atomic city. Um, and then you would check, you would note down the prior value, put the new value in, and then return the prior value, right? Synchronized guarantees that only one uh, thread gets to run this function at a time, okay? So you swap the old and new values, and you know swapping true is called a get and set. So all you're doing is just knowing down the prior in the program itself. Okay. So the lock is free, the value is false. The lock is taken, the value is true. You acquire the lock by calling test and set. Uh, if the result is false, you win. If the result is true, you lose. That is, um, the lock is busy, right? And you release the lock by writing false. All right, so what happens in this situation? Right? So in your program, uh, a lock operation essentially is going to do this while uh, getting set. Every other thing completes in a finite amount of time. Right? All the instantiation, the unlock, they're all fixed amount of time. Uh, whereas the lock one, this, this, this while loop, you really don't know how long you're going to keep iterating. You're going to keep iterating on the lock itself. It becomes free again. And this while introduces a bunch of overheads, and we'll look at why that's the case. Okay, so lock, just to iterate over this, the lock state is atomic boolean. You keep trying until the lock is acquired. 
and then you release the lock by just resetting the state to false. Okay, so the test and set spin lock has a small footprint, so it has only one variable. Right? That's the one of the big benefits of it. Uh, it uses all of one space, uh, as opposed to the other algorithms, um, namely the Peterson slash Bakery algorithm, which was the Gok Milk example, which is all of n. You need as many flag values as number of threads in the system. Right? It was an asymmetric solution, or one of the big um, negatives about it, but it's also O of n. If you do, try to do the mutual exclusion without atomic operations, then you need n variables for n threads. So the reason how we were able to overcome the O of sigma of n lower bound on the space by essentially using a read modify write operation. So this is all the good parts about the test and set. What about its performance? So we're going to try to understand its performance or behavior by essentially having n threads trying to increment a shared counter a million times. So you have one counter, each thread is going to try to increment it. Note that this uh, has no parallelism, there is no parallelism in this application. So first of all, we'll answer the question how long should it take and how long does it take. So our estimation or our guesstimation of what its performance should be and what happens in a real system. Okay, so what is its performance going to be? If you have a counter, if you have a single counter, right, and each thread is trying to increment it, then realistically there is no parallelism, right? It's all shared. There's only one, there's only, the only variable that you manipulate in a program is a shared variable. Each of us has to queue up one at a time to manipulate the shared variable to increment it. Hence, there is no parallelism in the application. So, your five threads, would it provide any performance benefit over one thread? Uh, not really. So, irrespective of how many threads you have, if there is no parallelism, then you expect a flat curve, right? So, irrespective of how many threads you have, you'll have the same performance or it'll take the same amount of time as a single thread. If a single thread takes five seconds, idealistically, 10 threads should take five seconds because throwing more threads is the problem does not buy you any parallelism in this case. Okay, no speed up because of the sequential bottleneck. This is our guesstimation. This is our guesstimation of what the program should behave like. Now, what happens if you have a test and set? It behaves like this. You have an exponentially increasing curve versus a flat curve. So, what happened? In fact, the exponential curve gets worse with the number of threads. So, as you keep throwing more threads at the problem, the problem started getting slower. It was taking more time to increment the same counter. And this is weird, right? Because all we did was take this counter and we threw more threads at the problem to increment it. There is no parallelism, fine. So at least you should get as bad performance or the same performance as a single thread, right? But instead what we're seeing is an exponential curve where as more threads are thrown at the problem, there's more slowdown. So what is going on? And to answer that, we need to understand a bit about what multi-core hardware looks like. And so that's what we'll get into in the next few slides. So to understand the hardware aspects of the system, we're going to actually, actually build another lock, which is called a test and test and set lock. So there's an extra test uh, step in the test and set prior to the test and set lock. Um, we'll look at the performance of this one and then try to disambiguate the two locks and try to understand the hardware aspects as to how the hardware actually uh, controls performance in this case. So in the test and test and set, we split the whole system, in the, the whole lock acquired procedure into two stages. We have a lurking stage and we have a pouncing stage. The lurking stage essentially waits until the lock is free. So all you do is keep spinning, checking if the lock is free. Don't try to get it. So we won't try to get it, we'll just keep looking if the lock is free. And when it becomes free, then we'll transition from the lurking to the pouncing stage. Okay? And if at the, in the pouncing stage we find that the lock is free, then we try to acquire it. If the pouncing stage finds the lock is false, we go back to lurking. So we have a constant uh, go in between between the lurking and the pouncing stage. Uh, keep lurking. Check if the lock is free. Once the lock looks like it's free, go into the pouncing stage. And in the pouncing stage, try to get the lock. 
Um, if you can't, then you lost, go back to the lurking stage again. So what we're going to do is try to look at uh, the code for this one, look at its semantic, its performance behavior, and then try to reason about why its performance is good or better than the testing set. That's a hit. So let's look at what a testing set, test and testing set lock looks like. So we've got your atomic boolean state again. So you've got your, you know, it's again false. That's all the same. But now you've got a while true. So you've got previously only had this while. Now you have this other while, uh, which so you which is infinite, uh, as you can see, unless you break out here. Okay. So what we're going to do is try to read the lock. Right. While the lock is busy, so it's a one. So while it's a one, keep spinning. The minute the lock becomes free, break out. If you manage to get and set it, then you got the lock. Then you break out of this loop. So you get out at that point. If you didn't get the lock, then essentially go back again, go back into this uh, lurking stage. So this is your lurking stage. Uh, this is your pouncing stage. So you wait until the lock is free and then try to acquire it, right? So if you look at the behavior test and set, and set um, you can go try this in your computers at home or in the lab. You'll see that its behavior is better. So in this, on the y-axis is time, so lower uh, on the y-axis is better. It's still not as good as ideal, but you have less overheads than the test and set lock. That is, as you keep kept throwing more threads of the problem, your execution time increases at a much uh, lower rate than the test and set lock. So the big mystery is that both test and set and test and test and set do the same thing in our ideal model, right? It just looks at the software, except that test and test and set seems to perform better and scale better than test and set. Both of them suck, right? Both of them are bad in that they don't give you ideal flatline performance. but if you had to choose one, uh, then test and set and set, which actually does more work, uh, has better performance than test and set. But not that neither approach is ideal. So in general, the problem is that our memory abstraction is broken. Um, we just assume that reads and writes took the same amount of time, um, that they all were instantaneous, and that there was no difference between them. So except that, you know, in the practice they're not the same and so we need to look at a more detailed model as to look at as to understand why there is a performance difference between test and set and test and test and set okay and so to do that we look at a little bit of hardware in the next segment